See, Donna, these are good glasses. They didn't even break when I threw them this morning, so they're strong. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a sandlot moment here in a second. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I, there's something wrong with you. You should watch Sandlot. But anyways. All right, so um, I know we haven't been doing this, but uh, I wanted to just finish up this chapter this afternoon. Oh, well, thank you, buddy. Um, and uh, just because it just, I don't want to forget the thought that we were talking about this morning when we talk about uh, the rest of this chapter. It was too much to tackle in one message, and I don't want to allow a week to go by before we finish, so we've read a portion of it. We're going to look at the entirety of the rest of the chapter as we go through this. Um, I don't have an outline. Um, I didn't really have much of an outline this morning, but just a couple thoughts, um, but uh, we just want to kind of do the same thing. So <clears throat> Jesus, uh, he had heard them murmur. Uh, verse 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he had said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? So here Jesus is trying to tell them, he's trying to convince them that he is the son of God. He's trying to let them know. As the actions didn't work, okay? These are folks that have witnessed Jesus in action. I'm talking in all his power as far as what he was doing in the flesh, the way he was manifesting himself in the flesh by healing those that were ha having ailments, by feeding the 5,000. These are great things. By walking on water, by calming storms. I mean, Jesus is God. And so he's trying to convince them of this. But all they see, and Jesus even makes a, 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 a test, uh, even states this, that a prophet has no honor in his home. Okay, what that means is people at home are just going to see who they grew up with. Very rarely. It's a rare thing that the, 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 the half-brother of Jesus Christ, James, uh, became such a devout follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's a, that's a miracle. Okay, um, so Jesus is, is, is trying to convince them. And what do they say? Um, there are those that are from Nazareth that uh, we know who this is. This is Joseph's boy. Okay? He grew up in Nazareth. I mean, how can he be the son of God? How can this be God? Because we know his dad. Well, no, they thought they knew his dad. Okay? They thought they knew his dad. We know, because we have the, the actual written word of God, we know that Jesus did not have an earthly father. That Joseph simply adopted Jesus into his family and raised him as if he was his own. But, so this is all they saw. They only see the literal. They don't see the supernatural. Their faith is not allowing them to get past, well, their lack of faith is not allowing them to get past what they can see. And let me just say that. If your vision gets in the way of your faith, the Bible says you should pluck your eye out. You understand that when the Bible's talking about it, if your eye offend thee, what's that mean? If your eye, if what you see is going to keep you from walking in faith, get rid of your eyes, man, because it's going to mess your life up. If you're going to be one that walks by what you can see, and what that means is if it has to make sense for you before you'll take that step, that's not faith. If you have to know the outcome before you invest, that's not an investment. Okay? That's not an investment of faith. So, Jesus is trying to get them to see, and all they can see is what they can see. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. I knew from the time I was about really 12 to 15, somewhere in that ballpark, I knew that I wasn't saved. I knew that I wasn't. I, I, I fought with myself as far as, well, I mean, I said the prayer, I said the prayer, I said the prayer, I said the prayer. I'm saved, I'm saved. And listen, nobody played church as good as Larry Hall, okay? Moms wanted their sons to be my friends and their daughters to be my girlfriends, okay? I put on a good show. Ask my wife. I was convincing. I didn't, not your parents. That's because your dad wouldn't be fooled by anybody because he was such a deceptive person himself. <laughs> Anyways, sorry. I don't speak ill of the dead very often, apparently too much. Um, no, my, I didn't fool my father-in-law because he saw me coming a mile away, but uh, I could fool the people at church 
And uh, I, I had convinced myself that I was all right. I had convinced myself that I was doing these things. And what I would say to myself was, especially after I turned 18, after I denied that, that uh, conviction at Camp Chautauqua when I was 18, um, I just kept telling myself, it's okay. As soon as I think it's close to time, I'll repent and I'll get right. I told myself that. I consoled myself with that thought that I could just go to God whenever I want. And can I say to you, that is a lie straight from the pits of hell. No man, no man comes to God without being called. Now all are called, but it's that moment in your life when the Holy Spirit is pulling and tugging. It's when there is godly sorrow, because without godly sorrow, there can be no repentance. Okay? There must be conviction. We don't get to just go to God whenever we want. Now, I will say this. I believe that we have a merciful, gracious, loving Heavenly Father. And that if you know you're not where you're supposed to be, and you have not felt conviction, can I say that if you will do all you can to draw nigh unto Him, He will honor His word, and He will draw nigh unto you. Now, that don't mean everything's going to be right when you go to Him. No, that just means you're a little bit closer for when the whooping comes. Okay? And I've shared an illustration for that. I don't have any kids in here to show it. My wife won't let me use her as an illustration for that. So, let's go on. So, he says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, for, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught, they shall all be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. And what Jesus is saying is that if you really knew my Father, you would want to know me. If you really knew, if you were really somebody that was seeking after God, you'd have no problem with who I am, is what Jesus is saying. He, he's trying to get them to understand, you say you know Jehovah, you say you know God, that you're following after Him, and yet if you were truly doing that, if He was what mattered in your life, then you would accept the faith that tells you that I am His Son. It is, or, uh, in verse 46, uh, not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he has seen the Father. And of course, Jesus is referring to himself. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And then he says it again, but there's more emphasis on saying, I am the bread of life. Now, I can't help but look at that. When Jesus says, I am, I kind of get goosebumps, you know what I'm talking about? Spirit chills. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You guys know what I'm talking about? When I hear the I am because, see, when Moses said, God, who do I tell him sent me? God said, I am. How else can you explain God? I mean, really, we could try and explain God, right? But God explained it as best as he could in saying, I, I am. I, I am what? I, I am everything that this says that I am. I am everything. I am more than you could even begin to imagine. Jesus is the I am. And he says, I am that bread of life. He didn't say, I am bread of life. I am a bread of life. He said, I am that bread of life. He said, he is what they need. He is the only thing that's going to satisfy their hunger for righteousness if they truly have one. He says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. And you'll notice as we continue to go through John and if you'll study the Gospels, you'll notice that the religious crowd, the Jews, Anytime they tried to combat Jesus, they would use the Old Testament, okay? Anytime they would try and trip him up, they would use the Old Testament, and they would try and uh, honor Abram or Abraham or honor Moses, okay? And Jesus would turn around and tell them, if you really were honoring them, you'd know who I am, because they spoke of me. And again, Jesus is trying to get them to understand, that manna that God supplied for you was a type of me. That manna was to help you to look unto me. It was used to sustain you, but it did not give you life. He says, your fathers did eat the manna, but they are dead. So uh, that isn't what I'm here for. He says, I'm not here uh, to feed you in your physical sense. I'm here to feed uh, your spirit. He says, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven. And I'm sure I can just picture him saying, this is the bread that came down from heaven. I'm the bread of life. This is what you need. And he goes on, this is, what, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. And again, 
We can take God's word literal in so many aspects that there's times we have to understand that he's talking spirit. Sometimes we have to take him literally spiritual. Okay? Does that make sense? I mean, he's literally talking of spiritual things. Yes, Jesus walked on the water. Yes, Peter walked on the water. Yes, there are physical things that we can take literally. But when Jesus is talking of spiritual things, we have to take them spiritually. We have to understand what he's talking about. And this was their wrestling. They were having a hard time understanding the spiritual uh, ramifications of what he was trying to say. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. In every aspect, Jesus is trying to get them to understand he is the Messiah. Israel since their conception, since even before that, since Abraham, or Adam has been looking for Messiah. The Messiah was promised to Eve in Genesis. After man uh, fall in sin, the Messiah was promised. A redeemer, someone was going to, the second Adam was going to come and redeem man. And Israel was the, 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 the chosen people. He was going to come of the seed of Israel, of Abram. And they are looking for him. And here he is standing before, again, the looking for Jesus is not as important as the why you're looking for Jesus. And so they were looking for him, but they weren't looking for him the way that he wanted them to look for him. And we see that because the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're, they're, they're still seeing with these. They're still seeing with these, and they're not seeing what Jesus is trying to get them to understand. He said, Whoso eateth, or, uh, then Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's the third time he said, I'll raise him up at the last day. Okay? What's he trying to say is, you, your flesh will die. Your flesh will die, but I'm the resurrection. Remember, we, well, we haven't, yeah, we did. No, we haven't. Ooh. There's so much good stuff coming up here in John. I get excited about it, okay? We're just, we're just scratching the surface. We're just getting into the, the, the good parts of John. There's so much in this gospel. And so Jesus is trying to get them to understand. So he's saying to them, he said, look, th th this is a spiritual thing. I, I, I'm, not talking, I, I'm not talking about eating uh, uh, my physical flesh. Quit looking at this a, 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 in a literal sense and trying to understand that I'm here for your souls, that I'm here to help you, that I'm here for your resurrection. He says, my flesh, for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Now, we understand, of course, Jesus isn't saying, here, come take a bite out of me, Okay? not what he's saying and we're going to get we'll get there i don't i don't want to jump the gun we'll keep going here i do want to get done in time so uh <clears throat> he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and i in him now here's where this is really important for us okay for he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and i in him we have talked about baptism at length in the beginning of john okay and how that baptism is a type this physical baptism into water is a type of the spiritual baptism into the Holy Ghost that the child of God is supposed to do. What does that mean? I, in, I, I mortify my flesh and I die to all that I am and be totally surrounded and encompassed with all that the Holy Spirit is so that I am then found in His identity. I am raised in the resurrection of His life. Not in my life, but in His life. Baptism is, is, is this outward transformation it is us changing uh, being changed by uh, who he is and now listen this is jesus trying to get them to understand that we have to take in all that jesus is you know um, i love the uh, uh, romans chapter 12 i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto god which is a reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed and then what do you say by the renewing of your mind what is that? That is taking in all that Jesus is. See, we got into quite the discussion in between services, a few of us did, because I said religion is bad, okay? But what I'm trying to get you to understand is our relationship with him means that we are surrounded by all that he is. That means who Jesus is is sufficient, okay? And being, and just taking in all that he is 
and understanding that in God's eyes, he's only ever going to see Jesus. And so for me to just take in all that he has seen, I really desire for others to see Jesus. And that ought to be, the, that ought to be each and every one of our, as a child of God, that ought to be our desire. And the only way that's going to happen is us for, to be changed in newness of life by being baptized by the Holy Ghost and being filled by all that Jesus is. Allowing what he is to be sufficient in, in all that we are, to be our identity. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using that phrase a lot as we go through John, that we find our identity in Christ, the who we are in Christ. And that's what this, this ingesting who he is is about. <clears throat> he said, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. The only way to live is to live by the things that Jesus fills us with. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So he taught him these things. He was trying to get them to understand. And, and I had this thought earlier. Let's see if I wrote that down. So with the thought that the Lord's communion, we, we observe the Lord's Supper, okay? Now, there's nothing transformational about the styrofoamy wafers that we eat, okay? And now, I, I say the grape juice is good, okay? We only use Welch's because I tried great value one time and I got, I got corrected, okay, by the Sanhedrin here at Faith Baptist Church. But we only use Welch's, all right? And so, uh, but those wafers, man, they're, they're rough. And I'm thankful, I mean, that, that we do that. But we do that to remember that we are to be filled with righteousness. No, not my righteousness. We are to be filled with holiness. Not my holiness, His. And so when Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteous, righteousness, for they shall be filled. Here are these people, they have rode for six to ten miles to get to where Jesus is at. And they want to be filled, but they don't want to be filled with righteousness. Because they have all of that that they need. They don't need that. They, they, want, they want their physical needs met. I promise, I promise if we just give the spiritual things to God, or the physical things to God and focus on the spiritual, he takes care of the physical. He takes care of the physical. So we have to understand, and Jesus is trying to understand, get them to understand that he is all that they need. And I, I believe that I've beaten that enough so we, we know that he is all that we need. So then we get down to verse 60. And there's some sad things that happen here in the latter part of the chapter. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Now what they're saying is, Phew. you ever had that? You ever, God just ever just blown your mind, right? Their minds were getting blown. They're like, okay, no, this, this, is, this, is a, this is crazy to us. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth, listen, nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are alive. Jesus breaks it down. He says, look, you guys keep focusing on the physical thing. The flesh profiteth nothing. What Jesus is trying to get them to understand, what I hope that we will understand, is we have to get out of his way. We have got to mortify our flesh. We have got to die to ourselves. Living the gospel means death to ourselves and a resurrection unto Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so he says, the flesh profiteth nothing. He says, but there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. And then verse 66 is just so sad. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You know what that meant? They got it and didn't want it. You can be a disciple and not be a Christian. 
because when you quit being a disciple, you don't have any Christian. If you're a Christian, you don't have to be a disciple. You'll always be a, you'll always be a child of God. Okay, but they quit being disciples. They didn't want to go into Why? They didn't want what he had to offer. This is a sad thing because these people literally are rejecting life and clinging on to death. But then Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Look, Even of the 12, there was one that didn't believe. Even of the 12, there was one that wasn't fully sold in who Jesus was. But Peter says, Lord, where else can we go? Where else can we go? And child of God, I want to encourage you to come to that state. Now, poor Peter, he hadn't even been converted yet. Peter's still a mess, okay? But at least he had this. He knew who he was following. He knew who he was following, and he knew why he was following him. He wasn't following Jesus. Peter decided on that boat, and we didn't really get to look at this. It wasn't in this gospel. But Peter decided, I mean, I've fished my whole life, and I've never done that. I've, I've, I've worked my tail end off, and I've never done that. So what can I do that's going to be of any use? He said, depart from me. I, I, I'm a sinful man. What is that? That is humility. That is coming to an understanding that you are not enough and that he is. So, of course, Peter says, where else can I go, Lord? Thou hast the words of life. There's nowhere else for me to turn. And listen, as wonderful as it is to come to that understanding, it's hard to stay there. It's hard to stay there. And we'll see that in Peter's life as we go on. And it's going to take a while. But I want you to keep that in your mind. This is Peter, and he makes a great statement. Thou hast the words of life. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Jesus was the perfect pastor. Amen? I mean, he is the perfect pastor. He is the shepherd. He is the uh, the best leader that man will ever know. And yet he had one that wasn't really following him. And while Peter and Andrew and James and John and Nathaniel and Thomas and Matthew and all these other disciples, they didn't know who Judas was. Jesus did. And listen, God knows each and every one of our hearts. He knows why you're here. He knows why you're doing what you're doing. He knows right where you're at and why you're there. And he knows where you ought to be. And so, man, I hope that we would come to the conclusion that where else can I go? My sufficiency, my completion is in Christ. My identity is in Christ. And then when we find ourselves back in our old life, much like we're going to with Peter, that we would just once again see Jesus and just go ahead and repent again. It's a, it's a continual cycle, folks. It's a continual cycle. There's none of us that are going to reach that point to where we don't mess up in some way, shape, or form. I am incapable of keeping myself right with God. But thankfully, I don't have to keep myself right with God. I just simply have to keep yielding to Jesus. He keeps me right with God. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's pray. Let's all stand. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the day. Thank you for these that are here. I thank you for the love that you have for us, God. Lord, help us to just be done with who we are and just embrace who you are. Lord, where else could we go? Thou hast the words of life. Help us as we try our best, Lord, to honor you with this. Lord, help us to remind ourselves every day of this. Lord, when we go to be fulfilled by something else, Lord, when we go to, Lord, 
focus on something else, God, that your Holy Spirit would call us back to putting our focus on Jesus, to point us once again to truth. Lord, I ask this that we might give you the praise and the glory, Lord, that we might show others who Christ is. In Jesus' name.